Welcome to Life Imitating Movies, a weekly podcast where myself, Mitch, and my co-host Brad, we talk about news stories from across the internet and the movies that we think have already been made that resemble them. So, you know, let's get right into it. You know, how are you uh, doing this week? Anything new going on these days? Anything at all? No? Absolutely nothing, dude. Yeah, me neither. So I, I will say I, I like how we both kind of coordinated. We both are wearing kind of movie related shirts, you know, Batman yeah. and uh, La La Land. So we we totally did that on purpose. We planned that ahead of time. So um, 100%. So the question I posed as the host this week is what movie do you think movie or franchise do you think is due for a a redo, a reboot, a remake, anything like that? It could use a good reset button and it could be good if it was made right. So you know, you could go a million different ways with this, but what did you kind of think about when you heard this question? So the first movie that popped to my head is actually a movie I picked for one of our later discussions. So I'm going to save it for that. Uh, so the other, another movie I thought about, we actually discussed a few weeks ago, which was with your question, which movie do I think could disappear forever, which was a wrinkle in time. So I threw that one out as well, and I settled on Waterworld. <laughs> because Waterworld is a solid concept, and in all actuality, it's not a horrible movie, but I think if it were to be remade in 2021, 22, now, with maybe a fresh set of eyes, a fresh, you know, fresh creative perspective to it, it could be a freaking gnarly, epic movie. Yeah, I mean, I guess I could see it could almost be like Mad Max Fury Road, but with water, you know, so I, I guess I guess I could see that. Sure. Yeah, I mean, it's it, that's that's a pretty apt comparison, Mad, a Mad Max Fury Road esque water based epic. I'm down for that. That sounds awesome. Fair enough. So. Um, when I was doing research for this question, a lot of the picks that I might have had for this question, there are already actually reboots or remakes in development for some of these that I kind of picked out. But I landed on one that I really, when I saw it, I was so disappointed. And that is the movie World War Z. And I was really disappointed because I'd actually read the book before the movie came out. And it was more of a coincidence because I didn't even know it was being made into a movie at the time. I just read the book because it sounded interesting and it was at the top of the New York Times bestseller list or whatever it was at the time. And the concept for people who may not know, it's basically what if a zombie apocalypse takes place in our modern world? How would we actually react in real life? How would governments react, people, countries, all that sort of stuff. And it's just, it's a fascinating book. The way it's structured is you jump around from different people's perspectives as they recount events about how the world kind of ended. So, and the movie is just, it's not terrible. It's just so incredibly generic and it doesn't use any of its source material except for the title. It's literally just Brad Pitt going around trying to survive against zombies. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's interesting. I mean, I never read the book, but it's uh, the guy who wrote the book is Max Brooks, who's Mel Brooks's son. So I, sh I should check it out because Mel Brooks is one of my idols. So um, the movie, yeah, I remember seeing it in theaters. <clears throat> and I'm not a huge zombie movie kind of, you know, I, they're good movies, but I'm not like, oh, my God, zombie movies are the greatest thing in the world. So I think I enjoyed it for what it was, which pretty succinctly put it brad pitt running around fighting zombies pretty much yeah it just like i said it wasn't a terrible movie it just it was one of the more egregious cases i could think of about wasting source material they literally just took the title and did nothing with it you know it just and i was so disappointed by that so one day i hope they redo this movie and they maybe not stick to exactly how everything goes in the book but at least take more things from the book and address them on screen. So recently we've seen the demise of this long-standing internet site, application, destination, whatever you want to call it, which is Yahoo Answers, where people can come to and just ask questions that are posed and people answer them to the best of their ability or sometimes the worst of their ability. So 
you know, this is one of those old school sites in the same vein as Ask Jeeves and these other ones where you would type in a full question and try to, to get an answer or something like that, where it was like a community answer. And it just, I get why this is kind of dying out these days. Yeah. I mean, I know, I don't recall ever actually using Yahoo Answers. Maybe if I did type in a question and something popped up, I can't actually remember searching out an answer from Yahoo Answers. I mean, I, I'm cool with some of the moronic stuff of the internet disappearing. You know, I think the internet and social media and that type of stuff has become a cesspool. So if we want to get rid of some of it, I'm good with that. Yeah, I just think it's kind of outdated and it's just really no longer kind of necessary. So it's just some of the questions that you would find are people, you know, they're, they're pretty silly or pretty stupid questions. So, um, you know, that's pretty much all there is to say about that. So, you know, let's just jump right into the movies. So for mine, it's a very loose association. You know, this is a pretty generic story. There isn't a Yahoo movie out there. So the association I have with it is a scene from the movie Fantastic Four from 2015. And the reason I picked that one is because there's a scene in the movie where they're trying to find some answers and trying to track down somebody and the technology and the way that they do it. It's very like, it kind of reminded me of this where it's very implausible and it's very kind of, to put it lightly, dumb. So that's the reason I kind of picked this movie. And it's really, it's not great. It just, maybe it was the studio interference case. Maybe it just wasn't that good to begin with but it's a shame because it does have a great young cast going for it yeah i saw it in theaters and i think as i've said numerous times i'm not a huge comic book guy so i didn't hate it as much as everybody else in the world seemed to hate it and the guy who directed it whose name i'm not going to remember right now but he also did chronicle which was really good josh trank trank there you go yeah so he did chronicle which was excellent and so i feel like he probably has a good movie in there somewhere because the way I, I really enjoyed Chronicle and, the, and as dark as it was and everything. And, and so I feel like, you know, I'm not going to start the release the Trank cut movement here, but I'm just, you know, it, I feel like if he, if he wouldn't have get, had that much interference as was reported, it was also reported he was a bit of a butthole on set. So, you know, you, you got to take all the news. Because I was just going to say that his reaction to critics' response to the movie is not is a lesson in how you don't take criticism. Because whenever somebody would mention a bad review or somebody would give him some sort of negative feedback on this movie, Josh Trank would just absolutely flip out and explode and lash out. And just it's just a lesson about, especially if you're a creative, you have to be able to take creative criticism, constructive criticism, excuse me. But, you know, it's just a lesson in how to not react professionally when someone points out a flaw that's in your movie. Yeah, yeah, it's it's true. You know, not everybody is good at that. I mean, there's another filmmaker. Um, I can't think of his name right now. I suck at thinking, remember names. But the guy who did um, Boondock Saints. That's another story of a director who just let ego run rampant and their careers suffered because of it. Although Trank, I think, recently did what Capone with uh, with uh, with uh, Tom Hardy, which I didn't see, but that kind of got trashed as well. So, and apparently he had a negative reaction to that as well when people again criticized the movie because it wasn't that good. Apparently, he did the same thing. He lashed out and he acted inappropriately to critics. Yeah, well, I guess you'll see his career. I don't, I don't think, yeah, I can't think of another movie he has in the pipeline. Usually a director will have something in the pipeline, but I don't think he has another one in the pipeline. So, you know, he torpedoed himself. Josh Trank, so. uh, snuff story. So, you know, it's a shame again, because this movie had such a great young cast and obviously they're going to reboot it soon in the MCU, which I hope they get it better. They do it better and they get it right. So We'll see how that shapes out, and I'm sure they'll get a great young cast together too. But you know, in the meantime, they we're already, kind of left wondering about what this future Fantastic Four iteration is going to look like. So I mean, to cut you off, but yeah, they already have the director. The director's going to be the same guy who did uh, Spider Man. 
John yeah, Watts. So I'm a fan of it. Yeah, because he did a movie before that called Cop Car, which I don't know if you ever saw with Kevin Bacon. It's really, really good. I mean, that's why he got Spider Man. So the guy, the guy's a very talented filmmaker. So I, th- I think he'll be able to come up with something good for Fantastic Four. No doubt. So where did you kind of go with this? You know, a little bit of a weird story. So you could go, you could take it anywhere, really. So I actually just, you know, I just went with the dumbing down of America. And I recently, as I like to point out, I write for a website, a YouTube page called Joe Blow's Movie Network. And one of my recent scripts was for a movie called Idiocracy. With Idiocracy, over the past 15 years, we have, there have been similar, there have been similarities between our real world and this movie that was made 15 years ago that um, have a lot of people making, you know, calling Idiocracy a a very prescient movie. And uh, a lot of that has to do with, you know, the the movie has um, the top program on TV is called Ouch My Balls, which is just a program where a guy gets hit in the nuts. Um, And and, uh, the lawyer in the movie is like, it's played by Dax Shepard and he's a, uh, He's a he's a complete moron, but he's the guy who's who's a lawyer. Which obviously, there's a million lawyer jokes to make there. Um, you have uh, uh, so you know not not to cut you off there, but it's just you know I understand that a lot of these you know days you'll have a story that kind of come out that makes you roll your eyes a little bit, and people kind of point towards idiocracy and say we're kind of going in this direction and. You know, you could kind of see that, but, you know, do you think this movie is maybe ahead of its time or maybe that, you know, they kind of rolled the dice and made some predictions based on where we were going or where we're at right now and the real world just happens to kind of line up with the movie a little bit, you know, which it's almost like a which came first, the chicken or the egg kind of thing. So I'll be honest, I'm not a huge Mike Judge fan. You know, some of the stuff you kind of listed up top that he's done, I, I, I don't have anything against Mike Judge it's just not really my kind of taste but I certainly understand the appeal of some of the stuff that he's worked on and essentially this movie too which is like a spoof but it's also kind of predicting the future so you know Mike Judge I mean do you think a fan of his would like this movie yeah because I'm a I'm a hardcore fan of it man I think Beavis and Butthead is some of the funniest stuff I think I've ever seen it's just that for me is gut level laughter office space gut level laughter man the guy the guy is is one of the best writers i think there is and it's it's uh and and this movie yeah it was it it's it's they, yeah it's a lot of people a lot of articles nowadays even time wrote an article about um have we become an idiocracy and so it's just it's it's i think you know my judge set out just to write a funny movie but over the last 15 years, it's taken on its, its, its a mind of its own just in, in the rise of social media and in the rise of certain things. Like, obviously, we haven't fully become idiocracy, but there are certain things in our world that have mimicked what he wrote in idiocracy, such as like big corporations sponsoring government level events. Like there was a big thing about COVID testing and there were COVID signs plastered all over the place and they were brought to you by Pepsi. And that's something he did in uh, the movie and stuff. So it's pretty funny. And it harkens back to the original story, which is just, you know, people, instead of giving a serious answer to a Yahoo question, they write the dumbest thing they can think of. And people kind of take that as gospel. And I feel like that's, in a nutshell, idiocracy. Yeah. So, you know, will this accurately predict the future? Only time will tell. We'll have to see. All right, so my first story this week was uh, a bit of a beacon of light, I think, almost, is that Broadway has been shut down for over a year since the COVID pandemic, and they just held their first in-person theater performance uh, with Nathan Lane performing a monologue, and then you had Savion Glover, who I am a massive Savion Glover fan. Um, He came out and did some tap dancing show and stuff, and and then for me, it's just a it's nice to see uh it's nice to see we're getting back to the semblance of normal especially broadway performers who you know i think a lot of people think of performers and people in the arts as people who have money and stuff but broadway performers were hit 
hard. They are not rich people. They they were hit hard. It's good to see that we might be coming out the other side on that avenue. Yeah, it's always good to see a story like this, something normal sort of start to make a comeback. And look, I'm all for that as long as we can do it safely, because that's what's most important to me these days. You see things starting to open back up and bigger and bigger groups of people getting together for different events. And that's fine as long as we do it safely, because if you just kind of throw all the safety out the window and people just keep this disease going, if they're not being safe, then we're right back where we started. So it's great to see something like this. Just please just do it safely. That's all. That's all I'm saying. But it's great to see something like this come back. And that's exactly right. I mean, I think safe safety is the word and we're seeing we're seeing places not do it safely i i uh it wasn't a story i pulled up but i i didn't i don't even know what stadium it was but perhaps you do there was a, a baseball stadium i think it was a baseball stadium that had a, a full capacity crowd with no masks yes so the texas rangers had a game during the week where they packed in the stadium they had no restrictions on capacity they said they were enforcing mask wearing but there was little to no one in the crowd wearing a mask so it's just it's something that you don't really like to see if you're being careful these days so you know, just getting back to the Broadway story for a second, because that's, you know, can be a whole different discussion in and of itself. But, you know, Broadway, everyone likes going to a show occasionally. Who doesn't like going to see a Broadway show? So Nathan Lane, you know, good for him getting back into this. And he obviously has a little bit of theater background as well. So I'm assuming, you know, you picked a, a movie that Nathan Lane has been in for your pick. I did not. I picked a Broadway show as my pick, which was Hamilton. I mean, that movie just came out last year. You know, the, the, the filmed version of Hamilton was put on Disney Plus last year. It was supposed to be like a major theatrical release this year, 2021. But because of the pandemic, Disney Plus actually pushed it up to put it on streaming for July 4th weekend. And I watched it, I think, the second it came out and... I loved it. I hadn't seen it on Broadway. I wasn't paying that much money. The only Broadway show I've ever actually seen was Book of Mormon, the Trey Parker, Matt Stone one. And I I did pay $200 to see that, but Trey Parker and Matt Stone are like idols of mine. So I, I wasn't going to, wasn't going to skimp on that one, but I, I, I Hamilton for me, man, I loved it. It, it. it, I had owned the soundtrack since it originally came out and I loved the music of that show. And so finally being able to watch it and see the performances with the music, it was just it, it. It for me, it was like as as a person who wants to do performing and stuff. I was just like, man, that's like it. It inspired you almost to be like, I I, I got to start getting out there and doing some some plays or doing some work like that, man. It was it was it. I loved it. Yeah, you're far from the only one that's a fan of Hamilton. Obviously, it's a huge sensation, both on Broadway and on streaming on Disney+. Plus. It was one of their most streamed items, if not the top one. I think it was kind of competing with The Mandalorian for the most streamed thing on Disney+. Plus. So it makes total sense. You know, a lot of people love it. I, for one, haven't seen it. And it just, it's not really up my alley, per se, but I certainly don't mind it. I understand why it's popular and I think it's inventive with how it puts the, the, I guess you would call it hip hop or just the music spin on just older stories about, you know, the times right before the American Revolution. So I certainly respect it for what it, it did and what it has caused people to, you know, really get behind and really capture people's attention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I, you can tell from my shirt, I'm a huge musical fan, so that's uh, I'm predisposed to liking a good musical and I like I you know I like what it did I, I you know a lot of people had an issue with it because it was uh you know uh putting uh, uh people of color in the roles that were normally white you know Thomas Jefferson and all that but it's like it's such a great like you you saw a lot of performers. I would not, I probably wouldn't know who David Diggs is. I wouldn't know who Leslie Odom Jr. is, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, if it wasn't for Hamilton. And, 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 and it's such a great story and it's such the music. I'm normally not a hip hop. Also, let's not forget that before Hamilton, Lin-Manuel Miranda probably wasn't a household name that maybe Hamilton made him more recognized by name for most people. Right. Well, 
before Hamilton, he did In the Heights. And In the Heights was a Tony Award winning match. So maybe not worldwide. He wasn't known like he is now in terms, because now he's like a movie star and all that stuff. But Broadway plays, I mean, he was pretty well respected because of In the Heights, which is another movie that's coming out in a couple months, which is like my most anticipated of this year. I, the trailer for that, dude, I've watched it probably 50 times. I love it. But I was going to say, was like, I'm not a huge hip hop fan, not a huge rap hip hop. Well, I like hip hop, old school hip hop, but what new rap music these days, I'm not a big fan of. So for me to actually like, like a soundtrack that is predominantly rap based, it really, for me, has to be like excellent. And this, the music in this is excellent. Yeah, I think it just has a lot going for it. It's really widely appealing. It's got something for everybody with its history and the representation and the soundtrack and it just and the pageantry. It's just like I think it just it has a really wide appeal to a lot of people, which is why it's been so successful as a show and as a streaming item for Disney Plus. So good for Hamilton. You know, let's let's see if they decide to maybe make some kind of sequel play if that's a thing or a branch off or just kind of figure out how to capitalize on its on its success somehow yeah, yeah so with that in mind i'm guessing you went with a nathan lane-esque movie so let's let's hear what you picked i did and i could have gone with a couple but i picked a really interesting one that i had completely forgotten about until i looked up his his filmography and that's the movie titan ae and for those that may not be familiar with it, it was an animated movie that came out. I think it was either late 90s, early 2000s, somewhere in there. They just all blend together those years. But Titan AE is a really interesting movie. It's almost a little bit more of an adult animated movie. It's like an action sci-fi genre movie, if you had to define it. But it was still kind of mostly targeted at kids. But... You know, there's some mature storytelling going on, and it has a really great voice cast. Matt Damon in the lead, Drew Barrymore as the female lead, obviously Nathan Lane and a few other ones as well. But And it's a really good, interesting mix of 2D and 3D animation, combi combining those two different techniques for some interesting looking shots. So it's really kind of a, a fascinating movie that I might go back and watch soon. Uh, I'm going to defer to you on that one. I've never seen it. I know, the only thing I knew about it was Matt Damon was the voice, and I wasn't even sure about that until you said it. Um, you know, I, probably not my, my, my alley. I'll probably never watch it, to be perfectly honest with you. But when you do, let me know how it is. Well, I will say, again, if you're looking for an animated movie that's a little bit of uh, a different thing than the animated movies that were coming out around this, obviously Disney kind of had the corner on animation back then. And, you know, all their movies... Not all of them, but a lot of them were kind of the same style and the same kind of feel-good family atmosphere. And this one's a little bit different where, again, it's like an action sci-fi story. And it takes place in totally different settings with different characters and voice talents. So it's really kind of an interesting kind of standalone movie. Almost kind of reminds me of The Iron Giant. This one-off, you know, interesting animated movie that's totally different from everything else that came out around it. So... I would definitely recommend it if you wanted to kind of watch something different in animation with a really good voice cast with a different kind of look and feel to it. So a huge story coming out this week is that Kim Kardashian West is officially a billionaire. So this has a lot of different people feeling some kind of way about it. Some are happy for her, some not so happy. And I guess, you know, I might lean a little bit more towards the not so happy but you know good for her it just you know again it's it's kind of an interesting debate topic to talk about with people about how they feel about hearing this news so brad you know what did you kind of think about when you were kind of listening and hearing this um well when you sent over your sheet on wednesday of your stories and i saw this i was like dang it mitch i've I have actively avoided everything Kardashian in my life. I I don't watch their show. I don't read articles about them. I avoid anything relating to them like the plague. So I read this, and yeah, so she's a billionaire uh, based off of what her makeup line or whatever. And and, and I, I, I will go the opposite of my normal inclination, which is yeah, good for her. 
She's a, she made money. She's a billionaire. She, you know, I, you look at, at what the Kardashians have become and, you know, you can't be super cynical about it, but you also, if somebody came to you and was like, Hey, Mitch, you know, 10 years from now, you'll be a billionaire. Just let me film you for, you know, let me just film your life. Would you do it? Yeah. Without a doubt. Well, I don't know who wouldn't. And that's not the only thing that she obviously made money from, you know, that you touched on like the makeup line and uh, likeness to certain video games, I think as well, like apps and, and mobile games and that kind of stuff. And these multiple different avenues that she's kind of used to, to build up that wealth. But, you know, no one's going to turn it down. It's just how she kind of got there and who she is that maybe some people have issue with. So you know, we'll, we'll leave that up to the, the listeners or the viewers or whoever to debate about. So, you know, again, this was kind of like an open-ended story about where you could go with a movie. So, you know, where did you kind of think of when you heard this story? I mean, I feel like I went obvious. <laughs> I, uh, you know, you just kind of touched on it. How did she become famous? Why is, why is Kim Kardashian famous? Because she made a sex tape. So the movie I went with is called Sex Tape with uh, Cameron Diaz and Jason Siegel. And it was actually one I hadn't seen in forever, so I watched it the other night. And it's pretty – it's a funny movie. It, uh, it's got Jack Black in it as well where he plays the, uh, he plays the founder of Pornhub. And, uh, you know, this falls in line with, like, the, you know, Jason Siegel movies of, like, that era, the 2000s tens there about or you know in between there where you know forgetting sarah marshall everybody's heard of but then you know he he had a string of movies that were like moderate successes that weren't massive probably didn't stand the test of time sex tape falls in there where it, it you know i don't think a lot of people nowadays remember it very well it wasn't a massive hit but i watched it the other day it's it's a funny movie and cameron diaz is gorgeous in that movie and She's since re pretty well retired from acting, which is a shame. I'm, I, I like Cameron Diaz. So just remember for the rest of the episode to keep it uh, PG. A lot of kids listen to this show. So, uh, no, I really thought you were going to say uh, Zach and Miri make a porno for your for your movie where you're kind of going with that. That would have been something kind of in the same vein. But I will be honest, I haven't seen a uh, sex tape when it came out. You know, it did kind of look like one of those comedies that Jason Siegel was in that maybe it wasn't going to be as good as some of his other ones. So I didn't see this when it came out. And I still really haven't seen it. But, you know, again, you kind of touched on it where he did make some really good comedies. So maybe one day I'll kind of check this out and maybe I'll get it'll get some laughs out of me. But, you know, this is like kind of a funny approach to this story some people may have kind of forgotten about that but um you know i will give you props for kind of going in that direction and picking this this movie to talk about because it seems like it might actually be a decent comedy to watch one day it is i have to ask was i not pg in my response or something was i did i toe the line I mean, the subject material is, is highly questionable. Let's, you know, let's just keep it like, you know, we're, we're in church, you know, let's, let's just keep it good and clean here. Good, clean family fun. I don't know how to do that. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, no. I mean, it is interesting, though, that this woman has become a, uh, a role model to children and her fame is 100% based on a sex tape. But I guess we can move past that in order to keep it PG and figure out what's a, what did you did you tow did you tow the line did you go the same way I went or how'd you go? So I kind of focus more on the billionaire aspect of the story, and I picked the movie Arthur from 2011, starring Russell Brand. And this movie, for those who may not know, it's about kind of this not airheaded but kind of absent-minded young billionaire who kind of spends money at the wazoo on extravagant things, and over the course of the movie, learns how to be a responsible adult. And for those who don't, not, who don't know about this movie, about what it's based on, it's actually a remake of an older movie, same movie called Arthur, same premise. It's actually a remake of an older movie. So, you know, this one I saw, it, it was a pretty good comedy. You know, a lot of the comedy comes from the premise where you see him buying and doing all these extravagant things and some comedy ensues from that. So... You know, we've talked about Russell Brand on the podcast before. I think he's a pretty good comedic actor. So, 
you know, this movie, I would I would say it's it's good. It's not amazing, but it's a good solid comedy, of course. Yeah, the original was uh, Dudley Moore, who sadly I don't think a lot of people know anymore, but he was he was the one of the top comedic actors of his day and stuff and 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 I enjoyed the remake, man. I I, I haven't seen it in probably what 10 years since it came out but as just a russell brand fan i will watch anything he puts out because i just i enjoy the guy i like the way he talks i think yeah, if you ever watch his stand-up the dude, dude is intelligent as hell and uh i like his i like the way he talk talks about the world i just I really appreciate that stuff and and when it came to arthur i think yeah if they were going to remake that movie there really weren't too many other actors they could have went to to do that i mean he was he was Arthur. He's pretty perfectly cast for that movie. Yeah, he did kind of fit the role really well and was able to bring that sense of childlike, not entitlement, but that childlike kind of attitude. And then over the course of the movie, he matures a little bit and kind of learns some lessons. So I think it did. It was a role that fit Russell Brand really well, for sure. All right. So next story I picked up was... Uh, there's been a long gestating court battle between Google and the uh, company Oracle, where basically Oracle accused Google of stealing little lines of code in order to make their Android system, I believe it was. And, and uh, the Supreme Court finally weighed in on that this week and said that um, they're fine with it pretty much. It's, it's not illegal for them to to uh, take bits of code in order to make something completely different. So just in, in terms of the article, how'd you, how'd you see that? And Yeah. I mean, you know, I've actually written some code before when I used to take web programming classes and, you know, stuff in high school or college, those sort of things. So look, I mean, code is, I don't know. I, I kind of look at it as a language. I look at it like, almost like the English language, where sure, you can take the same words that somebody says and rearrange them a little bit and then put them into your own paragraph. And it maybe sounds like there's a little bit, but overall, the purpose is different. It's your own words that are surrounding the little piece that you took from somebody else. So is it plagiarism? You know, it, it's kind of an interesting debate. So I don't really have a huge issue with this. I don't really think it's too big of a deal, but obviously... I can see how somebody would feel slighted by Google kind of taking these pieces of code and using it for their own stuff. Right. I think that was kind of the big thing was like, if even though I feel Oracle is a big company because I've heard of them, it wasn't like, you know, Joe Bob's coding company, it was Oracle, but it was the, the article plays it up almost as a David versus Goliath esque story of, you know, Goliath, Google stealing code from the little guy Oracle and, and using it to make billions of dollars and stuff. And, and so that was an interesting, it's interesting. I, I don't think I've ever code. I may have back in college done something to that effect, but couldn't do any of it now. Yeah. So, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of one of another one of these stories that's kind of up for debate that maybe got some people talking about what the story's about or whether it was right, wrong, anything like that. So interesting discussion topic for sure. So, you know, again, this is, this is a kind of a pretty broad story and it seems to be a theme of this episode where you could go in a lot of different directions. It's not like when we pick the same movie because it's a story about something so specific that there's only one or two movies out there that could relate to it so where did you go for this one so if our podcast is called life imitating tv series i would have went with silicon valley i don't know if you ever watched that show but the big plot point of that was uh people taking little bits of code and redoing it and everything but because we couldn't and you should watch silicon valley if you have it. it's a mike judge show by the way too so um i, I went with hackers which is like one of my all-time favorite movies, even though if you were to watch it now, it's a little bit outdated. Oh, that would have been a good one for the opening question too. Okay. Hackers would be a good movie to remake nowadays because the technology has changed so much. But that was like an early Angelina Jolie role. Uh, it's just a phenomenal movie, man. I still watch it probably once a year. I absolutely love it. Have you ever seen it? So I'll be honest. Not only have I not seen it, but I've never even heard of it. So 
for the people uh-huh. that don't even know about this movie's existence, just give a quick kind of synopsis, who's in it, what it has going for it, that kind of stuff. Okay, so Hackers came out, I think it was 1995, and it's a story about a, uh, a hacker who gets arrested when he's like 12 for crashing some huge government system. And then he gets out his 18th birthday, he moves to New York with his mom, he falls in with a new group of hackers. Um, they hack a uh, company doing just some, you know, kid type hacking stuff. But they stumble across uh, the head of security of that company and the CEO of that company are uh, stealing money from the company. And so they these these the head of security guy played by uh, Fisher Stevens, who I'm a big fan of Academy Award winner Fisher Stevens and Lorraine Bracco from Sopranos. They frame these hacker kids for stealing this money and they have to like prove their innocence and stuff while the FBI is on their trail. And, and like I said, it's got, you know, Fisher Stevens, Wayne Bracco. It's one of Angelina Jolie's earlier roles. Uh, Joni Lee Miller, if you're familiar with him. Matthew Lillard from Scream. Um, uh, Mark Anthony, the singer who used to be married to Jennifer Lopez is in it. Uh, Wendell Pierce. Just a phenomenal cast. Phenomenal music. I just bought the special edition soundtrack like a couple weeks ago because they just released it. Um, I, I, it's one to check out, dude. I would I would recommend it. I think I might, you know, it sounds like a good cast and a good premise. It just, you know, I'm always a little wary of movies that I've never even heard of because, you know, especially one from the nineties that's been around almost 20 years, you know, I'm just a little bit wary of maybe the quality of the end product, you know, if it'll be memorable, if I remember it 10 minutes after watching it. So we'll have to see. So, um, for this one, you know, it's a, obviously a story about Google, And I went with a movie that's essentially a big commercial for the company. And that's the movie, The Internship with Owen Wilson. I was so close. I was so close to picking The Internship. With Owen Wilson and Vince Vaughn. So for people who may not know, these two kind of dinosaur salesmen, guys who have been in the sales business for a number of years and get laid off from their jobs, go to intern at Google and end up learning from you know, the young kids that are also interns there and they teach them a little something. So it's not as bad of a movie as I think people give it credit for, but it's not great. It's it's essentially one big commercial for Google, but it's still a halfway decent comedy. I think it gets a lot of negative flack that it doesn't really entirely deserve because you get to watch Owen Wilson and Vince Vaughn essentially just kind of reprise their Wedding Crashers duo and essentially just banter off of each other for the whole movie so it's i I really don't think it's that bad of a movie yeah i think that's why it came out and failed was people were expecting wedding crashers 2 and they released it as a pg-13 movie and it wasn't it wasn't as good you know it felt a little bit restrained but on blu-ray they released the extended r-rated cut and it's not just you know a little 30 second clip that makes it r the movie was an R-rated movie. It has curse words. It has uh, some nudity. It's, it's, got, it's like a full R-rated movie. And for me, it's absolutely hilarious. Like the R-rated cut is phenomenal. It's hilarious. It's it's not as good as Wedding Crashers, but it it it, it touches it, man. It's 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 up there. And I, and I it very much enjoy this movie. I think it's hilarious. Yeah, so someday I might have to check out that R-rated version of it. You know, most times when you see an unrated version of a movie, it's really just a few gratuitous extra seconds of something just to, to justify people going for that version saying, ooh, unrated, let me buy that and check it out. But it seems like maybe this one actually appreciated that different kind of rating. So I think people shouldn't have maybe gone into this expecting Wedding Crashers 2 and just gone into it expecting a new movie starring oh, starring Owen Wilson and Vince Vaughn. And maybe someday we'll get a Wedding Crasher sequel. I've expressed opinions in the past on this show about long gestating sequels to movies that are kind of past their, their prime. But, you know, I think this movie still has some different kind of stuff going for it and still has an overall, overall a good cast. So I think it's, you know, a pleasant kind of Sunday afternoon movie to watch. You just kind of tune in in the background while you're doing something else and just enjoy it. Yeah, 
it's a good uh, description of it. Yeah, but good solid comedy, and I, I, I personally am looking forward to Wedding Crashers too. But we'll see. So during the week, if I'm not mistaken, we had our first kind of brawl in Major League Baseball where you had a benches clearing altercation between a few players. And how this started was Nicholas Castellanos of the Cincinnati Reds scored on a play and kind of bowled over the pitcher at home plate and kind of stood up and got in his face and kind of flexed his muscles. And it understandably started an escalation. You know, everyone kind of cleared from the benches and got involved and you know, it was a little bit of a tussle. So it's just always funny to see these things and the things that start them. So, you know, what do you kind of think about whether he was justified in starting a fight or if he should have just been more composed and been more modest about scoring on the play or just anything like that? Uh, I mean, I enjoy a good baseball fight because who doesn't seeing a benches cleared massive, you know, fight or whatever. It's always good. Um, I just think it's dumb. Most of these fights are started by the unwritten rules. And I think the unwritten rules of baseball are so dumb. And people get so mad over the stupidest crap. He scored. He went like this. Why don't you just laugh and be like, ah, get out of here. Why why start a fight? It's so dumb, these unwritten rules. You know, it's like it's the reason – like Madison Baumgartner is like my most hated player because he cries so much about unwritten. Somebody hits a home run off of him and he goes, a, you know, a little extra step. Baumgartner like tosses at him the next time and stuff. It's just, you know, these fights are, are cool to watch, but the instigation towards them is the dumbest stuff I have ever heard of. You know, that beef with Madison Bumgarner sounds like a true bitter uh, Dodgers fan who's always seen him on the Giants and now the Diamondbacks for a number of years. So it certainly sounds a little bit biased. But, you know, I'm with you where, yeah, the unwritten rules of baseball can be a little silly sometimes about, oh, well, he did this, so now I have to do this. It's a little stupid. But, you know, yeah, I think you're right. Who doesn't love a good baseball? Baseball brawl. So that's a tongue twister. So, You know, obviously, I think I went in a very specific direction with this relating to this story. And you'll instantly see when I say the title where I kind of went with it, because I picked the movie Anchorman. And, you know, if you think about the movie, there's this big brawl among the news teams, which is a hilarious scene that is an all timer that you never get tired of watching. So that's instantly what I thought of when I saw this story. Yeah, Anchorman is a. Yeah, and the, the brawl in that one is hilarious. And uh, um, I'll be honest, when you sent over your sheet, you forgot to delete what the movie you picked. So I just picked Anchorman as well so that we could pick the same movie. Because I, I, I actually thought about trying to find another movie, and I was like, I'd go Anchorman 2, but we can lump them all together. Which is, you know, these fights and these movies are hilarious i mean they are they were designed to be hilarious and that's where you got all your celebrity cameos you know the second one had jim carrey and all of them coming and will smith came in and stuff and and uh i think jim carrey was it was jim carrey in the second one yeah he, <laughs> yeah, was, he was he was one of the anchors that was in the big brawl in the second one and i will say i think the original is far better in terms of a movie and even in terms of the brawl fight i think it was better in the first one because it was just so unexpected and when you have these cameos that pop up as lead newscasters from other stations and just the the fight that just escalates so quickly with all these different weapons and different things going on that the the shock value is more hilarious in the first one than it is in the second and 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 even in the first one when they uh when they uh go to discuss the fight after the fact in his office and he's like Brick, Brick had a battle, actually. He's like, where'd you get that battle? It's just, even the commentary after the fight is as hilarious as the fight. And that's a that's a line. He says as soon as they get back to the office, well, that escalated quickly. That's a, <laughs> lot, that's a line that people still use to this day. You know, Anchorman, the first one, is, is so quotable. And, you know, I get that maybe people who aren't big Will Ferrell fans, because his movies certainly diff- have a, a unique style and structure to them. And I get maybe if people aren't big Will Ferrell fans, but there are certainly memorable quotes and lines from that movie that people still say to this day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They are they are good. I don't know if you ever saw the, the Anchorman 2 where they did a uh, – the Blu-ray has a completely – it's the same movie but with alternate cuts of jokes. 
and it's 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 an entirely different movie. It's it's really good. And even in the first movie, they released a separate movie called Wake Up Ron Burgundy, which was comprised of a completely deleted storyline from the movie. So the Anchorman movies, there are two, but really there's four. Yeah, so for me personally, I would put this up there in terms of one of Will Ferrell's best comedies. I put it up there with Elf. I really love Blades of Glory as well. So I would say this is one of his better comedies that he's had. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, Anchorman was the launching point for him, really. I mean, Anchorman was like his first starring role that came out and did really successful. And I mean, it's Adam Adam McKay, who obviously went on to win an Oscar for Big Short and stuff. So I, I would put it up there as a legendary classic comedy. And it's tough because he's had some good ones, but I think Anchorman, again, just the lasting impact that it's had and the lines that people still quote to this day that it's a classic, you know, it's, it's gotta be up there with one of Will Ferrell's best comedies. And that's saying something because he's had a pretty good number of them. Yeah. I still rank Step Brothers as my all time favorite Will Ferrell, but Anchorman is up there. That's fair. I would put Step Brothers top five for me too. It's definitely up there with one of Will Ferrell's best comedies. But, you know, like I said, it's tough. They're, they're, when you start to think about it, he do- definitely does have a lot of good comedies to his name. All right. So my last story of the week is uh, a story that you see and you're like, man, that could have been me. And it's essentially a guy found a still shrink wrapped super mario brothers the original nintendo entertainment system game he just found it it was still in pretty pristine condition it came from a limited run where apparently nintendo shrink wrapped their games as opposed to just putting the sticker on them which made it more rare and the thing sold at auction this week for what was it six hundred and sixty thousand dollars insane and it just made me go like, dude, if you would have had the foresight to hold on to a video game from the 80s or whatever. Like, we all had Super Mario Brothers. If you'd have just held on to the original copy, you could have made a cool half a million dollars this week. Well, hindsight is twenty twenty. Everyone likes to think, well, I could have done that. Well, unfortunately, you didn't. And, you know, I'm the same way where I think back to the stuff that I got as a kid as in the 90s in terms of toys and cards and all these different collectibles that are worth a lot more these days. Well, again, hindsight is 2020. So, you know, when I think about what's lying in basements, you know, old stuff that I've had, I don't really think I have anything close to this valuable. You know, you rack your brain when you hear a story like this, like, do I have something that's still wrapped up somewhere from 20, 30 years ago that could be worth something? And I know for sure I don't. So, I wouldn't, you know, get my hopes up too much reading the story if you think, hey, like this guy made this much money from this old video game. I got to have something worth that much, right? I mean, I do have, I think we've established I have a lot of collectibles around. I do have a Heath Ledger Joker figure that's rare that I think I bought for 20 bucks and now it's worth like 300. And, you know, I pulled this out. I have my, it's a Mall Rats script signed by Kevin Smith and Jason Muse. Got that. You know, that could be one day worth a lot of money, you know? And, uh, you know, it's, you watch that stuff and yeah, I, I remember back to, uh, home alone Two. you know, the talk boy, remember the talk boy in home Alone two that he has that he records into. Okay. Well, the, in home alone two, he has this device that he records into. It's how he does the hotel reservation. And I had one of those when I was a kid. Cause I think it was like, it was, the, it was like the toy of the season. And, uh, on eBay now, new ones of those go for a lot of money. And I'm like, dang, if I'd have just if I'd have just kept my talk boy, I'd I'd uh I'd be I'd be in living in riches. Well, you're already living in riches, clearly, but you know, no sense on <laughs> yeah. no sense on bitterly dwelling in the past. So um, you know, I feel like you could easily go a video game movie or that awful Super Mario Brothers movie with this one. So is that where you went with yours? That is exactly where I went with mine. I went to Super Mario Brothers movie, and this was the movie I was talking about in our opening, which is, I want this movie to be remade. They could remake this movie because, yeah, that movie, when it came out, it was a disappointment. I mean, I remember it from my childhood, so I don't hate it as much as most people. You know, Dennis Hopper, John Leguizamo, Bob Hoskins and stuff. So I enjoyed it for what it was. 
but I think that would be a movie that could very much be improved upon with a remake, redo, or reboot. I think you're right, and I will say I picked this as my movie too. So you know, this was very clearly a tunnel vision story where you have a clear you could pick one movie that perfectly relates to this article, and we picked the same one, the Super Mario Brothers movie, god awful movie. Because the thing is, I didn't see this when it came out or when I was a kid. I had heard terrible things about it over the years, and eventually I went back and watched it, and I thought, this is just, this is so bad. It has nothing to do with the game. It's just a bad movie overall. And apparently it almost killed Bob Hoskins. Wow, well, to delve into that, I didn't know that part. So, so apparently I was kind of relying on you because you're so knowledgeable oh. with these movie trivia <laughs> stories, but... Yeah, Bob Bob Hoskins just had one or two accidents on set that almost kind of killed him, that really kind of injured him. So it's just a bad movie all around. Just a lot of bad things brought out in it. And I think you're right. I think there's definitely room for a good adaptation or a good redo or remake of this. But also I feel like it could be a movie to really... It's It would be a movie that would be really hard to get right. That would be maybe a subtly tricky movie to bring to the big screen to make a Super Mario Brothers movie. Potentially. I think, I i don't think I'm making this up, but I believe they're doing an animated Super Mario Brothers movie. Uh, uh, they're in the process of making that now. I don't know if it's going to be like a, a, a um, Sonic movie, which was a combo animation live action or not. But so there is something in the pipeline to, to, to update that the story for the big screen. And, and, you know, time will tell how that turns out. Yeah, so, you know, just, I I think this movie is terrible, and I say that because, again, I'm not really looking at it through a nostalgia filter from watching it from my childhood and not really knowing any better, sort of like Batman and Robin. That used to be that kind of movie for me where I loved it as a kid, watched it after a number of years and said, wow, this is terrible. So, you know, I, I'm looking at this movie through unfiltered, no, no nostalgia goggles, and I said, wow, this is just an awful movie, and it was one of those ones that I just, I had to see it for myself, you know, where people have just talked about it so negatively, and rightfully so. It's just a random, has nothing to do with the source material, just not even a good movie overall. It doesn't really have too much going for it. Yeah. Yeah, nostalgia does play a lot into it. I think I watched it last year at some point because it's one of those movies I'll watch, you know, every couple, not every couple of years. I think before last year I hadn't seen it in maybe 10 or 15 years. And, you know, sometimes you do just want to watch a movie that's so bad, but your memory of it is like, I remember seeing this as a kid. Yeah, I've never really been a big, I have to watch this movie because it's so bad, it's good. I feel like those are just wasting my time. I'd rather just go watch a good movie instead of a, oh my God, this is so terrible, it's got to be funny, but I'm not laughing as much as other people when they see a movie that, that that's that bad. You know, so I kind of, I almost look at it as like a look, unless it's a, a movie like Sharknado, where it's just this perfect storm of terribleness, where it leans into the comedy a little bit, where it's just it really is worth the time sink to watch a terrible movie that I'll just skip on those kind of movies. I'll say, you know what? I'll just do something else for two hours. Fair enough. So for our movie of the week here to kind of close out the episode, obviously last week we had a new release movie with Godzilla vs. Kong, and there really isn't a big one of those this week. So instead we're throwing it back to the 80s with the classic Fast Times at Ridgemont High. And this is just such a classic comedy for me. I really think it's funny. It's got a, a great cast going for it, you know, looking at who was in it back then and where they kind of took their careers afterwards. It's got a phenomenal, almost an ensemble cast, you would say. But it really is just a great kind of teen coming of age kind of comedy from the 80s. So, you know, what do you have to say about it? Yeah, it was one of the... With the 80s, you know, when it came out with a lot of these high school movies that everybody respected because they took high school and the characters, the teenage characters, seriously and portrayed them as real human beings and stuff. And and this one was, you know, written by Cameron Crowe, who went on to be one of the biggest filmmakers uh, alive with, uh, you know, Say Anything and then Jerry Maguire and stuff. And and um, Amy Heckerling directed it. 
who uh, you know went on to do Clueless as well. And uh, and as you said, the cast. I mean, the cast is phenomenal. You got so many great people, but really, it's a lot of people know it as Sean Penn, obviously Spicoli, and then Nicolas Cage as Nicholas Coppola, who I don't know if a lot of people know he's Francis Ford Coppola's uh, nephew. Um, he just plays a bit role in the movie as a burger flipper. And so it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it has, you, like you said, a, a, a cast of people who went on to greatness. Yeah. And, you know, you kind of talked about some of these other eighties teen movies, you know, that are iconic. And I wouldn't really say fast times at Ridgemont high is in the same vein as the John Hughes movie. You know, I feel like those are deeper into the characters and really have an emotional perspective to them. And look, there is some characterization to this movie and the characters are three dimensional, but this is just more like, you know, just a classic comedy, just a uh, hijinks and, you know, crazy scenarios and just teenagers kind of doing their thing. So I would say it's less like a dramatic kind of John Hughes character study and more like just a, you know, just a classic hijinks kind of teen comedy. Yeah, so it just, you know, it has an amazing cast that um, in the 80s were pretty good for their time. And then guys that guys and gals that have gone on to bigger things afterwards. And I still get a kick out of that Nicholas Coppola thing where he's in it for five, ten seconds in the movie. And he originally wanted his name to be Coppola instead of the Nicholas Cage that we, we know and his name that, you know, he obviously changed later. But, you know, like I said, it's just a good movie to just sit down and enjoy it's not a kind of heavier teen movie like The Breakfast Club or even Ferris Bueller's Day Off has some questions that you kind of ask and some dramatic moments in it. But this is just more just a sit down and watch it 80s teen comedy. Right, right. Yeah, I agree. And I will say it has one of my favorite scenes, which is where she says, you know, Brad, I always thought how cute you were because, you know, I saw that scene and it just makes me smile because and also it's like she's talking to me. When we were talking about the cast before, let's not forget, we forgot to mention Forrest Whitaker, of course, too. He's in it, obviously. He has a, a funny scene where he thinks his car is vandalized and single-handedly demolishes the, the rival high school's football team to win them the big homecoming game. And it's just it's it's just so great. It, it just has so many classic scenes and lines in it. Yeah, and it's like, yeah, it's, it's the supporting characters in that. I mean, think about it. It's like Nicholas Coppola, Cage, went on to win Best Actor for Leaving Las Vegas. Forrest Whitaker went on to win Best Actor for Last King of Scotland. Uh, 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 Sean Penn went on to win two Best Actor Oscars for uh, uh, Mystic River and Milk. Um, you know, and all the other actors in it and stuff. Uh, Jennifer Jason Lee was nominated recently for Hateful Eight. Um, uh, Judge Reinhold, not nominated, but I love me some Judge Reinhold, man. If you like Beverly Hills Cop, you love Judge Reinhold. Yeah, he's he's certainly been around and been in a number of stuff and is one of those familiar faces that you like to see him act and see the things that he's in. He certainly picked some some good projects over the years. So Fast Times at Richmond High, what else can you say about it? It's just a really enjoyable, funny 80s teen comedy that has just such a funny, likable lead in Sean Penn as the surfer stoner Spicoli. So I'm going to go back and, and watch it soon. You know, I, I think right now it's actually on HBO max. So I might give it a watch pretty soon after this. Yeah, I was going to watch it last night, but it was, it got late and I didn't feel like throwing in a new movie, but I think you're right. Is it's one of those, I might maybe do like a run of, of classic teen comedies and that'll, that'll definitely be in that run. Thank you to everybody for tuning in on another episode of Life Imitating Movies weekly podcast with myself, Mitch, my co-host, Brad. So we'll be back again next week, Monday, 10 a.m., brand new episode. And I believe we're going to have a we're going to have a special episode coming up next week. Yeah, man. Next week, we're going to delve into uh, the Oscars. So we're going to have a nice discussion about uh, last year's movies and, and the performances and all that stuff of, of uh, coming up for Oscar Sunday. Absolutely. So it's going to be an, a great episode. So thank you to everybody for tuning in for this one, for listening, watching. And we'll be back again next week talking about all these big Oscar candidates. So should be a good episode.